Okay. Hi, everyone. You have to meet this guy, <laughs> Dr. Mike Fenster. Mike, we've known each other a number of years. Yes. You're probably one of the most exciting doctors I've had a chance to <laughs> talk with, work with, and you're about to find out why. So you are coming to us, you're in Missoula, Montana, right? Yes, uh, I'm up here in uh, Montana, hunkered down uh, like many folks are. Um, I, however, uh, as a interventional cardiologist, I have traveled and actually recently just kind of got off the front lines, um, you know, with the virus and dealing with those things and working uh, as I do with the culinary medicine course, which you as one of our prize instructors uh, in our introduction to culinary medicine course are familiar with that uh, we teach at the University of Montana. Yeah, that's really exciting. And we are definitely going to go full on into culinary medicine. But let's tell people what an interventional cardiologist does, because they probably have a lot of people have no idea and well, why that's so important right now. Well, as an interventional cardiologist, most people are familiar with cardiologists. Obviously, I focus on taking care of heart issues. Uh, interventional cardiology is a subspecialty. So when somebody's having that heart attack at 2 a.m., I'm the guy they call to go in and acutely deal with that open the blockages, put in stents, uh, those sorts of things. And then, of course, deal with patients in the post-heart attack or post-myocardial infarction period as well, trying to get them on a path of recovery and dealing with any damage and dealing with the issue of atherosclerosis, which is most people think of a heart attack as something occurring at a point in time, but what that really indicates is that you have a lifelong inflammatory disease. And how do we deal with that? And, uh, you know, right in there, let's just jump right in, because what we're seeing right now in the coronavirus era, <laughs> this yes. what, what we're seeing right now is, of course, we think of the older people being, you know, more, being more at risk, but that doesn't explain the younger people, right? But what we do know, there's a huge swath of people in the middle where comorbidities matter. Yeah, and particularly we're seeing, um, as I've heard from some of my infectious disease colleagues, that diabetes and pre-diabetes, meaning metabolic syndrome or having over diabetes, just not being aware that you had it because it's such an insidious disease, is a particularly malignant risk factor for not only getting the virus, but then being susceptible uh, you know, to the complications of the virus. And it's what's interesting, as some of the infectious disease folks have said, it's not something that we might typically see with a viral syndrome, whereas you mentioned, mostly we think of influenza as affecting the older folks, and certainly this virus, this pandemic does, and that is one of the comorbidities, but this weakness in terms of underlying inflammatory conditions, chronic inflammatory conditions like diabetes, like underlying you know, heart disease, coronary artery disease, seems to make people particularly susceptible to this. Yeah, no kidding, because inflammation deeply impacts the, the vasculature, right? It undermines endothelial function. And so once you do yeah. that, then, you know, you probably amp up an immune response just as part of that. Well, I, I, you're absolutely right, uh, Amanda. And, it, you know, it's, it's fascinating. As an interventional cardiologist, uh, when I go into the hospital, I deal in a small area of the world. You know, I'm pretty much in, in the cath lab, seeing patients acutely. But and, and sometimes I think because of the structure of Western medicine, where everybody's a specialist, uh, you know, we forget that the, the body is an is a complex organism that's tightly interconnected. So the heart depends on the lungs, depends on the kidneys, it depends on our immune system. And then you tie that into our background of genetics and, and the gut microbiome, which you and I have chatted about many times, uh, which is you know a, a completely sort of foreign entity that is it cohabitates our body and, and yet is so responsible uh, for health and wellness or disability and disease. Um, Suffice to say, human beings, just in terms of health and forget everything else, we're pretty complicated. <laughs> we are complicated. Yet, just before we kind of came on and started recording, you, you, we're going to talk about culinary medicine. You know, because Mike has this other specialty that dominates his life when he's not in the cath lab. This is his focus. But you had said, and I think we all agree, this, has cha this will change our world forever. I, I absolutely agree with you. 
I think what coronavirus has done, certainly as somebody, and I think you would agree, somebody in this kind of healthcare space, is it's really exposed a weakness in the, in the system. And for me, what I see, and I think, you, you, again, um, you would agree, because we've talked about this, is that Western medicine, we've not done a great job treating these chronic inflammatory kind of low level inflammatory conditions for decades. Western medicine is great if you're in a car wreck and you break a leg and you need surgery. Uh, those sorts of things really derive from battlefield medicine, but not so good at, at the chronic kind of conditions. And we've kind of put a Band-Aid on it. And I think coronavirus has ripped that Band-Aid off and exposed the flaws in the system because really we don't have an answer for coronavirus. Everything we do to treat it is just really right now supportive. And that's a scary place to be in a pandemic. Yeah, it is. And it would explain the kind of, um, kind of as you said, this breakdown in our system. That doesn't help us right now, right? Yeah. But of course, what and, and really, I want to let everybody know, toilet paper has nothing to do, <laughs> to do with it. <laughs> You know, talk about that. I, mean, I guess we'll all laugh and we do all laugh, but um, I was in Greece, you know, you and I were in Greece yeah. several years ago when I went back um, last year with a group and um, we kind of got together just to come together on Saturday. And so one of the questions to our host is Greek is like, so do you have a toilet paper problem in Greece? He's like, I don't get this toilet paper problem in the US. He said, we're going to say, just use a bathtub and you need to. Just, uh, but they have a problem, is you, you know, exporting or finding a market for the peaches and the strawberries last night, right now. And you can imagine in those tiny communities, that's devastating because they can't have those little markets that are so important to the Mediterranean. It's, yeah, the fallout is, is, is quite huge. But uh, I don't know, how do we get on that topic? <laughs> Great, so the toilet paper. <laughs> the toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> we can manage, we can manage. But you know, one of the things that has jumped into culinary medicine that one of my colleagues said is, you know, there's going to be some good things that come out of this. And one of them is going to be telemedicine, hopefully. Yes, I, th I think so. Um, you know, it's certainly an aspect. And I think also telemedicine and the things in the world uh, that you and I, you know, share, which is this culinary medicine space, you know, in all its wide ranging aspects, because people are looking to do and, and say, you know, what can, can I do? Well, um, eating well is one of them. And it's not just nutrition and it's not just about the healthy kale recipes, but in the context of, you know, improving and, and being happy, enjoying our delicious food. We know how, important it is and, and something we cover, you know, in, in the course you and, you and I share, which is, you know, these, what I call these softer, you know, edges in terms of how we eat, with whom we eat, mm. all those things, uh, attitudes about how we eat are coming out to be more and more important. Almost like if you can imagine, there's a, a placebo effect, there's an attitude effect of how we eat. Uh, one of the things, you know, I worry about in this space, I've got a lot, as, as I'm sure you do, friends in the restaurant business, and we need to support those local mm -hmm. restaurants. But I worry about folks getting endless, you know, fast food, junk at food, takeout from Uber and delivery and, you know, DoorDash and all those things. Because what we eat, well, that's going to affect our immune status and eating these crummy foods at home and then going out with a, a lowered immune system increases susceptibility. So I think that space we deal in in terms of the preventive medicine aspect of culinary medicine is very important. And that's, that's something I think that lends itself to uh, telemedicine, you know, communication. Yeah, no, totally. And oh my goodness, we could talk forever about that communication part. Um, so I want to talk about that and then uh, really get into color. We'll get to coloring medicine because <laughs> we we'll talk for like hours and hours here. I do agree about the takeout stuff and actually just coming in on that. Telemedicine is a huge take home from this. And what I see is it allows me to work with Mike without, you know, the licensure issues. Like Mike can say this client, this state, Amanda, you have an expertise in genetics like, or nutrigenomics. Can you work with this patient? They know for me as their doctor, this is what you need to do and vice versa. Um, oh, where was I going? I was going somewhere with communication. <laughs> yeah. So the other part, you know, looking at genetics is that food is really, really important. You know, uh, we'll get to that. But the point that you said about eating together and being together, our genes as human beings respond to connectivity. 
Right. They, they, they do. And, and one of the fascinating studies, you know, that I've come across, and this was research done out of Stanford, is when they simply told people that they had, and they did this with both a gene that predisposes a good outcome by producing, you know, certain proteins and things, and a gene associated with a negative outcome, obviously the same mechanism, when they told people that they had it or they didn't have it, the body responded uh, by producing or not producing those proteins, even in people that didn't have those genes, which oh. nobody really quite understands now how that works, uh, but gives you some idea, and, and obviously we, you and I have talked about this before, but the power of the placebo effect, mm -hmm. which most people, when I, I talk to them, and, and certainly even medical people, tend to think of that as a null effect, meaning, oh, it means that nothing happened. And that's the, kind of the opposite. What it means is that about a third, and what we find is the more intense the uh, placebo, so like s subjecting somebody to a fake procedure or operation, the more powerful the effect. So when they believe it and they believe in the outcome, that outcome manifests in a way we can't explain. Mm -hmm. And likewise, there's also what's called the nocebo effect, which is kind of like voodoo. If, if I put a curse on somebody and voodoo, and I believe I'm gonna die, these people die from no apparent medical cause they just their systems just shut down it's something known as, as the nocebo effect so the, these are powerful they're real um, we're measuring them uh, the japanese have done a lot of research in this uh, looking at the effects mm -hmm. of forest bathing uh so yeah. right so if i give you a meal nutritionally exactly the same and have you eat it in an office cubicle under stress doing this and that to get to the next, you know, meeting, clients, you know, stress, a bad environment versus giving you 30 minutes that maybe the same amount of time to relax in a park, laid up against a tree, experiencing the forest and nature around you. The body's physiologic response in terms of anti-inflammatory, in terms of lower blood pressure, are right, completely different. So obviously an effect, a measurable effect that has really nothing to do with what we're eating but how we're eating, with whom we're eating. And so all these things that sort of the ancients would tell us, you know, the celebration of food, the feast of food, and, and right. we, you and I, you know, cover that in the introduction course that we do in the culinary medicine course we teach, the data is just accumulating, accumulating incredibly important. And that speaks to longevity in the Mediterranean, yes. right? It speaks to things like Ariachi Bu and, and Okinawa. I mean, it's more than food, people. Um, it's, it's also that spirituality element, which doesn't mean religion, right? It means right. connectivity to your space, to your environment. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, I always think about one of uh, the, the first lectures you know, I watched from you where you talked about the experience of that guy who went home to Icaria with the pulmonary uh, carcinoma. Oh, yeah, 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 given. Yeah. I, and I've never forgotten that from your lecture because it was it's such a powerful story. And, and, you know, here it is. Yes, it's an N equals one case. But as you said, when we look at the blue zones and, and the work done by Dan Butner and all that, we find that that's a, a consistent finding. You know, it's that that community and i often get you know asked um and i'm sure you do too about the mediterranean diet and people will say well gosh you know is it the food they eat is it the wine they drink or is it the fact that they do that together and it's it's a big community meal which goes back i think to a lot of talk in the united states where we see a disintegration of that family meal that family time together mm -hmm. one of the aspects of social distancing and putting families back together is now there's an opportunity to reinstate that cultural tradition um, eat together yeah. share the meal cook the food um, all the things you point out that we find in cultures where, you know, people do very well in terms of health, longevity, you know, function. Exactly. And where food is, is the center, it's, it's the thing that brings people together. So, you know, two outcomes. One, we know uh, that from this, the current, current pandemic, but it may change medicine and telemedicine, amen, <laughs> in many ways. And, and I want to, I want to, I want to jump in and say that the course of, of which uh, Amanda does a, an incredible job doing genetics and nutrigenomics and uh, actually is one of our faculty at the University of, of Montana in our culinary medicine program um, is all online and we're working on getting that online once 
there's been issues, obviously, as universities have had to shift to telemedicine to complete courses and things. Uh, but the course that, that you and I uh, do and the extension of that actually is being set up to be made online to the general public. So uh, I want to put that out there that, that uh, folks will get that. Yes. Yeah, so we'll chat about how they can find out about that before we jump off. So if yeah. I forget, Mike, say, hey, Amanda, they need to know what they're <laughs> um, But, you know, the other thing with the pandemic, like I said, so families are now, people are now forced together whether you like it or not. So <laughs> guess what? Cook, because that's how you're going to save money. You bring the unit together. When you prepare your own food, you control your environment. I always say this, that unless you can, when you go out to eat, unless you go to a place where you have the best chefs, who really understand how to run a kitchen and can monitor everything and the sanitation, et cetera. When you eat out all the time, you outsource your health. So now's the time to own it and to bring it back in, in the house. It's, it's that, that is, that is a, a phenomenal. I don't steal in that, by the way, I'll footnote you, I know, I know. But, that, but that is, you know, a great way you really are outsourcing your health. You're giving that control over, which is why when, I go out, I'm so particular, I go to chefs that I know, restaurants that I know, I know where they source it, you know, as a professional chef that, that, you know, you got a little bit of kind of insight into the industry. But as you say, when you do it at home, you also get to exclude what you don't want in your food. So yeah. you can leave out those additives. You know, I put something up the other day, uh, just sharing some culinary medicine, practical culinary medicine tips, you know, and one of the comments was, oh, well, about adding, you know, sure. I said, I never add sugar, you know, to my savory breads. Often you'll see that in recipes, commercial breads are loaded with sugars when you're buying it off the shelf, but that's something you can exclude if you're making a simple, you know, bread at home is yeast, salt, water, flour. That's all you need. Um, and it's a living food, you know, watch yeah. it rise, do it with the kids, you know, let them pound on that dough, uh, you know, form it. So it can be a fun exercise, as you said, to cook with a family. I mean, that's, gosh, that goes back to, you know, the roots of humanity, right? It, it does, it does. Uh, and one of the reasons we love Italian or Greek cuisine <laughs> so much is because we think of Nona, right? We think yep. of Nona. And you know, and many people listening also know, you go to precious parts of Greece and it, it's still the same as it used to be who knows the guys are down the street <laughs> but, the but they're only drinking coffee or whatever they'll be there all, all day <laughs> sorry mike but you know. it, uh, <laughs> well it was it was great i was watching uh, a documentary on evan funky you know a michelin uh, award-winning chef and all he does is pasta hand-rolled pasta so no pasta machine but where did he go to get the recipes it, it showed him going to the nonas right you know and, and, and all these little areas you know this area for orchietta uh, you know this area for the ravioli uh, yes, you know so yeah. on and so forth but like you said you know he was in these little tiny kitchens with the nonas because it's just been handed down and so no rest you know the pandemic is a, is a terrible thing no doubt but like anything we have to start to say what can we get out of it where can we get positive because the otherwise you can get overwhelmed and you can drown in negativity well, and sorrow and, and these are these are things that we can do you know exactly. um and share that, uh, and particularly over food and ancient human tradition, and, and maybe recapture a little bit of our humanity, you know, interfacing it with the technology. Like you said, it's the telemedicine, it's the, the Facebook sharing of recipes and tips, the culinary medicine that we share to give somebody the ability to take it and then bring the humanity into it, you know, right. by, sh by sharing it. And as you said, by applying the culinary medicine that, that you and I teach in terms of sourcing the ingredients and knowing how these things work, how they work right. we, we, um, we, you know, empower, we stop outsourcing our health. <laughs> well, totally. So, so let's jump into culinary medicine and we'll come out again and go back to the university of Montana. So what comes to mind, cause we talked about immune systems and as I'm dialing through this thinking, what's the ultimate recipe, you know, why aren't we in the ICU? We're not going to go into the depth here. Why aren't we using nutrients? In the IC, well, we kind of are, right? In sort of IV and high doses of A and D. And I'm sitting there thinking, I know how, I know how Mike thinks. He's also a professional chef, by the way, folks. We're gonna say that. So he, he fixes food and he fixes like your vasculature. <laughs> but we don't want. He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to be a fixer anymore. If you far rather cooking, right, Mike? Then yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The cardiology part, but 
what comes to mind to me, and I was thinking about this morning before I was going to jump on and talk with you, is what you're hearing is people need vitamins A and D, A and D, A and D. And they, they occur naturally in food. And what's interesting, having read your work, Mike, and having cooked with you is A and D is very prominent in some of the foods you cook because you're using whole animal foods. And if you're vegetarian, vegan, hang on here. You know, we're not. <laughs> we'll he, get to you. <laughs> he, cooks great, he, he cooks great food. But I know that, you know, part of your message too is whole foods. And you think of foods from France, from around the world, even the Caribbean, uh, et cetera, et cetera. People use the whole animal and some of the most nutrient dense sources of food come in the, 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 sort, the parts of the animal that we're throwing away, right? We're talking about vitamins A, D, and CoQ10 are found where, Mike? <laughs> that we need to modulate. Right, well, they're, they're, they're found in what we might call, and it's spelled differently, the awful. Uh, as, and as a chef, and one of the, the tips we share in culinary medicine is culinary, when I ran a professional kitchen, as the chef in charge, you know, food is my biggest, is one of my biggest sources of potential expense and waste. So we have to be very thrifty. And for example, you know, what you talk about, and here's an example, I did a video the other day, I bought some organic whole beets. Now, you and I are, you know, very in particular about how we source our ingredients. And, and we know that, you know, these, the way these beets are raised, when I look at them, because they're fresh, they're organic, they're wholesome, they're local, that, you know, the, the vibrancy of the green leaves and the purple of the beets is actually reflecting the nutrient content because mm -hmm. they're not allowed to be sprayed with like, you know, conventional carrots, orange dye number, whatever, you know, to, to trick us into thinking, oh, those carrots look really orange. Well, it's a dye that's sprayed on them. This reflects that. And to me, it also reflects the flavor that you're going to get from that. And then we take, you know, well, I've got to cut off those stems and those leaves, and I'm going to use those greens to make a pesto. I'm going to use the beets to make a salad. I'm going to, you mm -hmm. know, combine those things back. Same things goes with those animal bits that you're talking about. So if you look at the Okinawans, people often point to the seafood and the seaweed in a diet, but the Okinawans are the largest consumers of pork yeah. in all of Japan. I know. It's Inter amazing. Interestingly, they only use the heritage breed that's raised in Okinawan on sweet potatoes. So it's all kind of local, organic, fresh heritage breed animals. When they run out, they do not import commercial from China or from the mainland of Japan. And here's the kicker is, is what you said is they use, you know, everything but the oink. So they're making these stews. Yes, exactly. And so they're using these stews in which, you know, you're taking the awful bits, you're taking the tough bits, these broths are dissolving the collagens. Uh, mm -hmm. What we and you look at this craze for bone broth. Well, what do we do in America? We go out, we buy some celebrities' bone broth for eight bucks for a cord, when you can make it for you know about thirteen cents with all yeah. the leftover bits. You know, it's those carrot tops. You throw it in. It's it's how we make stock in the in the restaurant business. We take the bone bits and we just kind of let that stew for hours and hours. And again, that's a great thing that people can do at home to extend their dollars because you're going to pay more for the quality ingredient but that's how you extend it you don't waste anything and what you have hit upon is one of the ways I think one of the key ways to make culinary medicine practical because people don't have unlimited budgets particularly at these times yeah. so how do we do that eat delicious food that we love Make sure that food is nourishing us and strengthening our immune system and realistically do it economically. It, it's doing what you just said. Right. And you know what, by the way, on the broth, you probably have some great recipes, Mike, but uh, also on the bone broth, you can do it in a pressure cooker, folks. You know, get the Instapot out. Like, you know, definitely in a restaurant kitchen, you know, that there's that lower level kind of like <laughs> heating element and the pot this big. And it's <laughs> For like 12 hours it gets a stir or whatever you do you know but it, it's it's a, it's like a cauldron in a kitchen I don't <laughs> like it's big enough for a cauldron but yeah um, yeah the bone broth so this snout to tail um so it's definitely the the, the, the okinawa will eat beautiful pork but i think one of the important things is across the world and i grew up in europe so i always think of, of france 
is they, you know, the gelatin. There's a lot of food that's, that's preserved in aspic, which is the gelatin. You hear at the pate, you know, and, and what we call head cheese over here, but the charcuterie is using all parts of the animal. And what is the major sources of vitamin A and D are being the pieces of the animal that are thrown away, the old liver and the kidneys. Yep. We want to rush out there. But that's what I'm sitting there thinking, this is what we're trying to do in the ER. And I'm like, technically, this should not be, it's not, this shouldn't be necessary because some people do get really sick. But if we're cooking the way our nonas are and the way you're talking about, Mike, we can mitigate a lot of this. Absolutely, Amanda. And I, and I think one thing that we, I've always seen, you know, we continue to get information and we see, oh, you know, atrial fibrillation is associated with low vitamin D levels. This is associated with low vitamin D, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to remember, and, and I understand that we're kind of throwing everything we have because, as we said, we don't have a treatment for coronavirus. Uh, so we're throwing everything we have in terms of the supplementation. But correlation isn't cause. So the reason that these people, you know, with low vitamin A or vitamin D levels may be the sicker people may not be because those vitamins are missing per se, but that those vitamin levels reflect a really poor diet yeah. and thus a weakened immune system Correct. before they present. And so, um, I, you know, I understand that, but people shouldn't translate and confuse correlation with cause. Certainly as a healthcare provider in a situation where we, again, we don't have a definitive treatment. I can't just give you this pill. You're going to get what we're going to use everything at our disposal. Exactly. So those treatments make sense. But I think if we look closely, particularly given sort of this ubiquitous vitamin D deficiency that seems to correlate to all these things, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, what it really correlates is with chronic disease that as you and I talked about earlier, then seems to be a risk factor for being susceptible to increased severity of the COVID infection. And so it kind of goes back to, as we said, looking at culinary medicine through the lens of preventive medicine. Yeah, no, exactly. We're not going to use culinary medicine as acute care medicine. Although yeah. I do sit there and think, knowing as we do know how nutrients are so critical to the immune system when you're blocking these cascades that result in a cytokine storm. I'm sitting there, Mike, saying, if somebody's on a tube feeding, can we put some spinach and parsley? Like, <laughs> you know, can we put the bio like, like high potency bio <laughs> You know, or and if you and if you want the preventive version, try a little spanakopita. <laughs> you know, I remember in you know I don't want to make light of this, but one of my colleagues who's a gosh, the farm is in his seventh generation in Connecticut now. You didn't get to meet the crumbs, uh, my but uh, the crumb Joneses, but she used to work at Yale University as a dietitian, and back then, so this may be in the sixties, all artif or artificial feedings or tube feedings were made in the kitchen. Huh. Everything. That's interesting. So, so think about it. That's culinary medicine is best. And, yeah. you know, for patients who uh, have recovered, who've been on tube feedings for whatever reason, they can taste, you know, okay. so we bypass the, 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 the mouth, but depending on where that uh, tube is inserted, patients do taste or sense that food. Think yeah, it's, it's a fascinating, just as sort of a, a tangent on the research is that actually the taste receptors they found go through the entire gastrointestinal yeah. tract. Exactly. So we're always tasting everything, you know, that we eat. And then everything that we eat is then affecting that gut microbiome, which is in turn turning our some of our genes on and off, producing exactly. compounds. And so that gut microbiome is that interface between, you know, the earth and us, what, what we bring in from the earth, the environment, um, and then, you know, our relationship in terms of that. And, and I think, you know, that's one of the, the powerful aspects of culinary medicine, you know, as, as we do in our course, is under trying to understand that and framing it in terms of relationships. Because in the, to me, in, in sort of the big picture, that's what life is. It's, it's all about those relationships that we have um, and strengthening them and building on, on creating those positive relationships. And, and uh, you know, food, we have a relationship with food. Let's make it a good one. Let's make it a positive one.
Totally. No, absolutely. That's, that's why we exist, right? It's why I actually yes. work with you. So the culinary medicine. So let, let's define culinary medicine and let's talk about the future of medicine with the culinary art. So culinary medicine. Well, uh, first, to give a little background, as, as you know, uh, and, and some of your uh, viewers may not know, it's, it's a very new discipline. So you can go on the web and search it and get, you know, all these sort of takes on culinary medicine from, you know, culinary backgrounds without sort of a lot of the medicine part and you can go to the other extreme uh, I know Tim you know uh, runs it you and I know Tim who runs a course that's you know very much sort of at the medicine end of it and it's very medicine in its approach you know it's nutrition some you know tasty kale recipes and you need to eat x y and z because I'm a doctor and I told you so and kind of the whole gamut in between those goalposts and so our approach is uh, evidence-based. So it's an evidence-based emerging discipline. And that means that it's, and we're also multidisciplinary. So it's not just nutrition. We're looking at your area of expertise, you know, nutrigenomics and genetics. Uh, we're also looking at psychology mm. and sociology, understanding why people choose certain foods. How does culture affect that? Uh, looking at it from the culinary aspect as a chef, you know, um, and again, our course is done in conjunction, so it's a cross, unlike a lot of culinary medicine courses, it's done through our, I have a cross appointment with our dean in the culinary school, as well as the College of Health. So it's a synthesis, um, and, and that's, I think it's very important to emphasize it's multidisciplinary, evidence-based, so we're looking at the science, it's gotta be good science to direct that, uh, and it's, so it's a multidisciplinary, evidence-based approach, to the procurement, production, uh, and examination of the techniques of preparing food with an eye towards health and wellness. And so that is very broad, very encompassing. And the introduction course of, of, of which you're part and, and you teach you know, some of that more rigorous science and the genetics and nutrigenomics and is broken up into three silos and it really reflects you know our approach to culinary medicine at the more intensive levels which would kind of be like a minor and then a degree program and that is what is your first question what is culinary medicine how does it relate to culinary arts how does it relate to medical arts you're not going to be licensed by a state board when you finish our course to you know do heart surgery or brain surgery you're not going to be qualified to open a michelin restaurant but I've been with graduates of some other culinary medicine courses, see them out trying to, to work with patients in culinary medicine, and they have no culinary skills. They don't know how to hold a knife. And, and you've got to have some culinary basics. If we're going to teach culinary medicine, I've got to have some familiarity uh, with the culinary arts. I have to understand the preventive medicine relationship to culinary medicine. I've got to know nutrition, at least the basics. Uh, we've got to understand those nutrigenomics and how genetics play, those scientific aspects. Then our second sort of silo, if you will, looks at these non-ingredient choices. So as we were talking, this, these softer edges, you know, how does culture, society, uh, those influences, uh, you know, the way you were raised, right? You know, the things we experience as a child are known to reinforce our behavior as adults in mm. terms of pleasure and reward. So those affect our food choices, uh, you know? So there's, there's a whole lot there that goes underneath the iceberg in subconscious, unconscious. And if we're gonna affect behaviors, we have to understand that, we have to share that with people. The gut microbiome, the addictive nature in terms of biochemical processes yeah. of modern Western medicine, what we're talking about with these you know, junk foods, fast foods that are engineered to prey on us by overloading our reward centers with sugar, salt, and fat, and, and we're eating out of addiction. And then and finally- play, I wanna stop that right then and hold on to your finally there, cause I wanna come okay. to that. But, you know, like you said, you talk playing on and praying on and people are like, oh yeah, right. That's due with willpower. I will tell you, no. you know, from genetics, people's genes are cocked. Some are, I mean, I looked at a, a, a report the other day and I said, oh my goodness. You know, I've never seen a set of genes that would predispose someone to more addictive eating and snacking. 
And I didn't, you know, a lot of times I look blind and then I'll talk, I look blind at genetics and I form an opinion and then I'll talk to the individual and I and I'll ask questions. Do you have a challenge stopping eating? She said, especially if it's something sweet, bingo. She said, yep, you bring wow. in one cookie, I'm going to eat them all. So this genetics really has underscored the science. So what you said is absolutely true, Mike. Okay. Well, and, and, and to just before we finish, to kind of build on what you're saying. So let's look at how diet and, and sort of culinary medicine is. If somebody has a weakness for that and they fill their pantry with cookies, they're going to be in a bad way. You know, yeah. they're, going to be, they're going to be ordering, you know, a side of insulin with, that, with those cookies before long. Yet if they don't, and they acquire a taste for the fresh, wholesome foods mm -hmm. that we were talking about with, you know, minimal added sugars, then that weakness, that disease never has a chance to express. Yeah. So, so often in medicine, I hear my colleagues, and you probably hear it too, where people talk about, you know, disease causing genes. And I, I really dislike that term because I think it's what we need to look at is that, the those genes are a marker that something will express itself in the right environment so yeah. you take that patient out of that environment with all that sugar diabetes is not in the picture correct and so that shows you the power of this new field of science which is genomics and genetics i mean i tell you mike it's to me, I look at a report and see if I can work with the doctor to order the right biomarkers for me. It's like, bingo, this is the story of you, which then feeds right into culinary medicine, which is these are the techniques and the foods you need to eat because they will work in harmony with your genes, period. Now, that's kind of the most advanced area of where we're working with, but um, it's where we're headed. So, <laughs> well, I, I love it because that that really is, and I've said this many times. the 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 story of food is the story of us, and our personal food relationship is the story of us as individuals. And when you say, you know, that's your story, I, I love it because that is when I think of culinary medicine. You know, that's what I think it is. It's a, it's the story of us. You know, expressed in our food relationship, and that last silo is all about how to make those good food choices. Uh, we talked about, well, you know, hey, you know, Chef Dr. Mike, do I need to pay more for this organic vegetable? Yes, because there's a lot of studies that show that from a nutrient perspective, you know, one serving of that, maybe two or three servings of conventional vegetables, plus you're not getting these things, um, which may have detrimental uh, impacts. You know, if you're making your own, you know, mayonnaise, uh, for example, you're not getting polysorbate 80, which would negatively impact your gut microbiome and we're finding that all these additives you know that people worry about oh i don't want to eat meat it's it's saturated fat well the biggest source of fat in the modern western diet is condiments salad dressings yeah. all this sort of stuff and those things are loaded with you know modified you know conventional uh you know, gmo oils and stabilizers and things like that that people don't even really think about in terms of negative effects. Oh, I'm just going to put a little bit of this, or I'm going to go to the fast food place, eat fresh, eat healthy, but I'm getting the Chipotle seasoned, you know, dressing on it. That's, that's just a, you know, gastronomic and inflammatory, you know, bomb. So true. It's so true. You know, that you're right, right there. And I'm going to come in from genetics. So I know that's my area and that's, you know, you and I share that uh, fascination, but, those kinds of foods your genes don't recognize. So what do they do with them? They probably like send up some kind of inflammatory radar. Uh, no, don't recognize, don't recognize. Like, well, well, we'll put it here until maybe we recognize it a hundred years. I don't know, but we're learning so much from genetics of just how inflammatory our environment is. Well, um, what so we, do, we do know is exactly what you just said, that the end result is that they go into this pro-inflammatory milieu. So your body shifts from where it should be to this pro-inflammatory state, this chronic ongoing low-level inflammation that over time weakens your immune response, your ability to respond acutely to things like a viral infection or a bacterial infection and sets you up uh, in, in a correlative 
fashion, you know, data wise to, you know, obesity, which is not just being overweight. When I say obesity, we're talking about that inflammatory precursor that's associated with, you know, type two diabetes, heart disease, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, you know, all these things that we're saying, um, you know, my good friend, Marty Malarkey, uh, uh, Marky, who, has been on Fox News all over, you know, from Johns Hopkins, and he had a conference, and he's one of the world's experts. He's a GI surgeon in terms of performing surgeries for people with inflammatory bowel disease, mm. and, you know, and he thinks like we do in terms of prevention. He's like, you know, Mike, before the 50s and this huge shift in the way we eat and the foods we eat, he goes, you didn't even read about inflammatory bowel disease. That's and and awesome. I think, you know, and he and I shared, you know, the answer isn't to give another powerful antibody inflammatory. I mean, all you have to do is listen to the side effects and I don't want that thing unless we're putting out a fire. It's true. And yet, Mike, I, I don't know what percentage of your patients you see that, you know, obviously you're working with the heart and the vasculature, but how many of them have, uh, if you even know, also present with dysbiosis? I mean, is there a correlation that you see? Uh, well, what we're seeing is that, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, well, back in the dark ages when we used, you know, leeches and chants, and when I was in medical school, um, you know, there was no association between these things, right? The, like you said, heart, gut, completely right. separate. Uh, one's a clot, one's, you know, these erosion of the, the bowel lining, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. And we find now that having inflammatory bowel disease not only doubles your cardiovascular risk, yeah. it significantly increases the percentage of the severity that drops. So not only we, is your risk increased, but the likelihood you will have a severe complication in terms of cardiovascular disease is increased. So they're linked. And as you just point out, where are they linked? They're linked at that inflammatory root. So to quote Hippocrates from 2,500 years ago, all disease begins in the gut. And I go back to when people say, yeah, but you're a heart doctor, a cardiologist. It's like, yeah, and how do we get to somebody's heart? Through their stomach. Oh God, right, <laughs> it's so, no, it's so true. And, and you know, one of the main ways, there's so many ways to short up the gut, you know, with, which we can't really talk about today, but of course we would uh, in culinary medicine is through uh, fermented and cultured foods, foods of the ages, right? Foods of our ancestors. That's what they did. They extended the harvest. Uh, by putting up foods, which we, they didn't know they were making medicine, but they were. And, and, and I think if somebody's looking for a great starter book, they've got to get your book, which is oh. required reading uh, for yeah. our course yeah. now. Yeah. It's yeah. on our list of textbooks, The Genomic yeah. Kitchen. Somewhere I, I love that book. I love the, you put the recipes in there, yeah. uh, but how you incorporate what what I think is just a powerhouse, which is naturally fermented cultured foods. And we talked about bread earlier, right? That is a naturally fermenting product. We use yeast or lactobacilli. Uh, wine, and we talked about the health benefits of, of wine and, and even beers and things like that. Those are naturally fermented products. So it's it's more than sauerkraut and kimchi. And right. and you you dedicate, uh, you know, a important and appropriate space to that in the book. And, and I love the book um, because it told a story. You know, I'm big into stories, as you can tell, relationships, stories, food. And, um, you know, I love it. I, I, and it is, uh, you know, on our list going forward as, because it came out after, you know, the course started, but going forward in the course, it's one of our textbooks. So you want to learn important aspects of, of culinary medicine, you know, pick up a, a copy. If, you, if this, if what, you know, Amanda and I are talking about interests you at all, then, then that's required reading. Yeah, the genomic kitchen. But yeah. Mike, uh, beyond the fallacy. So tell them where they can get it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, on Amazon. You, you, you are you give we give you give too much away for free. You're, you, you like me are an awful <laughs> business person. It's a fantastic book. You got to tell them where they can get it. <laughs> on Amazon. So wait, who's doing the interview? Is it you or me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just trying to help people. These are the and these are the resources they yeah. need. These are so absolutely the, the resources. Kitchen, they need. So my website, the genomic kitchen, but also Amazon.com. Amanda Archibald, The Genomic Kitchen. But well, I wanna, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to a couple of your books because they're really cool. Then uh, let's go back to vitamins A and D. I can't, I can't stop. I, we cannot get out of here without going back to the animals. Okay, Mike, because you're really good. <laughs> really good chef. Um, and then finish off with culinary medicine again. So you wrote The Fallacy of the Calorie, but yeah. right after that, it's a cool book. But it's hard hit. Mike, 
does not spare anything. <laughs> if you want to know the fallacy of the calendar, right? Amazon. But you wrote a book after that was super cool. Oh, that it was about the shaman, right? But then you wrote uh, another one. Uh, after Fossil Cow came Ancient Eats. That that one. Right, Stop which that. looked ancient. at the uh, ancient Greek cuisine during the classical period, and and basically it's and also looked at the Viking culture because I want the diametrically opposed. So people often think Mediterranean, all you know, plants, olive oil, no fats. But we also looked at the Viking diet, which you would know is the, and, and probably talk about is the new Nordic diet, yeah. uh, you know, based on Noma, one of the best restaurants in the world. And, you know, what do we think of when we think of Vikings? We think of feasting and meat and, you know, plenty of beef. Um, but the, the, although the items may be the same as we could get today, the way that those foods were produced was very different. Obviously, the beef would be what we consider, you know, grass finished cattle as opposed to CAFO and, and a concentrated animal feeding operation type process, etc. Uh, but that just kind of tells a story so folks can read along. It's his, what I call historical food fiction. So everything you will read about the food and the history, where you go, historical characters, that's all accurate. Uh, the people who take you, the chefs who take you on that are completely made up based on, at the time, um, it's still one of my uh, you know, sort of culinary heroes, Andrew Bourdain to take you through ancient Greece and chef uh, Gordon Ramsay to take you. Uh, and then we finish with uh, the latest one is food shaman, which builds on fallacy of the calorie and starts to look at some of those softer edges uh, that, that we talked about. So that the how, when, the where that we eat, the cultural influences and the science behind that. And, and you know, there's a whole chapter there that simply looks at food and sex and how as human beings, we process those in the same area of the brain. So, you know, Anthony Bourdain, you said, you know, good food leads to good sex as it should. And why is that? Cause he's right. Uh, you know, he did always spoke the truth and it's because they, you know, they, they, they're like next door in the, in the condo of our brain, you know, they live right next door. And so, when we try to, to teach folks about food and health and we just do it in a very dry scientific fashion and say, you need so many international units of vitamin A, you've got to take so much vitamin D each day. That's like saying, well, you know, sex is just for procreation. That works for a few folks or you must abstain, you know, who live in a monastery, you know, uh, or a cloister. Uh, but it, doesn't work for the vast majority of people because that's not how we're built as human beings. Right, right. No. And so it's about understanding that. So the, the book's a little more broad reaching than than fallacy, but but really, as you can see, kind of ties back into uh, how the, the course is constructed and how our approach to culinary medicine is based, you know, at the university. So talking to that, and we're kind of coming up towards our hour. We could talk forever. <laughs> we, we could. <laughs> I never do short interviews. <laughs> hour. That means I talk to very, very interesting uh, professionals. So culinary medicine. Um, so there's a couple of different access points, right? If you're a medical student, I mean, one of the targets is, is our medical students, right? Or, and, or existing doctors, existing doctors, like currently practicing, <laughs> sorry, practicing physicians, like who... Divide up the courses for us. So uh, as, as we say, and as we've talked about our course, um, folks come at it from a healthcare perspective, right. which includes our providers. And, and actually, I just received an appointment at um, a Kansas uh, health cent uh, healthcare center, uh, health sciences center in Wichita. So we'll be delivering this to medical professionals, gotcha. uh, to a new okay. medical school, because uh, I was appointed there for culinary medicine. And so there's, there's obviously, that's kind of a pathway into what we do. Uh, also know from the culinary perspective. So folks that have an interest in food, uh, folks that prepare food, uh, certainly even culinary professionals, so more than sort of the casual person. When we think about, you know, how some healthcare institutions are, are forward looking and starting to incorporate this saying, well, you know, if you're in charge of the meals to our patients, you know, one of the things that really inspired me, um, if we have a minute for just a personal story. So, you know, I was at a, a place in Seattle, um, which before the outbreak, uh, which is one of, right, like food capitals in terms of, you know, great progressive food. And 
a 28 year old came in with a heart attack one night. So we took her emergent cath lab, put a stent in, in a branch of a, an artery. And the next day I was talking with her and she was, you know, obese, uh, metabolic syndrome, all these sorts of things. And it was a Saturday. And so I was spending a little time, you know, talking with her and she's like, listen, I know I don't eat well, but the advice was do this, don't do that. She said, I got confused. So I did what was easy, which was the drive through. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm just looking for some direction. I want to be better. I don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. And as we're there talking, lunch comes in. And the lunch consists of deli meat on white bread with a slice of processed cheese-like food substance, a salad where, I, you know, the, the, the cherry tomato, you could have played ping pong with it. The ubiquitous green jello, you know, and a thing of salad dressing that had all those yeah. additives that we talked about in terms of condiments. And I thought to myself, self, what are we doing here? This person's looking for advice. Exactly. And as the healthcare institution, we're saying this is what you should go home and eat. This is what you should seek out because this is what we're feeding you. And on both a very you know, cognitive level and on a subconscious level, we were reinforcing really bad information. And so the people that do, you know, the food service for the hospital, for the patients, that's, that's an opportunity. Talking to my dean of culinary medicine, she, she was telling me, she, Chef Amy was telling me, she, you know, I get calls every day, she said, of hospital systems looking for people who'd be interested in this. Wow, you know, you're on the front lines of culinary medicine coming from the food service aspect, mm -hmm. um, the opportunity then to create a dining hall where the family can go and get things. That's kind of um, what we're doing down in San Diego, right? At, at yes. Shark Healthcare, which you've seen, but it's just a pilot, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, so these are the things that that we want to open up to folks from the culinary, for chefs who want to do that, for for uh, some of my friends, you know, work with celebrities in terms of preparing the meals for them. They can afford these people, but certainly these folks can go out and get get the training and, and do classes, share this, and, and help grow this culinary medicine community, you know, on the web. And so people who don't know can have, an, have a point of entry um, from folks that have done the training, know what they're talking about. Because like so much of things that are not strictly regulated, and, and even when it comes to that, you know, there's a, just a lot of bad information. There's a lot of misinformation. Um, you know, people coming out and saying, oh, the only thing you can do is, you know, be a vegan. And the foods that they're using are these highly processed foods with chemical additives to add smoke flavoring and yeah, make, you know, make, uh, you know, tofu taste like meat by adding these compounds. I mean, you know, I was talking to one pediatrician who said that when these, these plant-based foods came out, the plant burger, there were 40, over 40 novel proteins that humans had never ingested. That's my concern. And yeah. genetically... Should, and she's some kids that came in with anaphylactic reactions after eating. So, yeah. What does the body do with something it doesn't recognize, like the virus? It, <laughs> it attacks. It, it, it attacks. It's called inflammation. Yes. And if you can't control that, it's a full on immune uh, cascade. Uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you're right on with food service. So the people that can attend, it's going to be online. It's online. So we just worked on an introductory course, right, Mike? Right. But it, this is a big product in place. That's we, yeah, so we are using the, the downtime at the university. Uh, once we get everything shifted over to kind of uh, not telemedicine, but teleteaching, as it were, which, which is similar, so that the kids can, um, kids, young adults can finish yeah. their, I'm showing my age, that they can, you know, finish their okay. courses and, and, and things online. Uh, I, we're working on developing out uh, the course itself uh, will be available uh, next semester, as it always is, for anyone who wants to enroll and take it at the University of Montana. But we will also be going online uh, through futurelearning.com to mm -hmm. offer this, and you'll get a certificate, culinary medicine level one certificate in culinary medicine for completing our intro course. Then uh, basically to correlate, there'll be three levels. 
you can obviously get a degree at the university if you want to pay for the credits or thing, or you can get the equivalent certificate, which would be kind of a minor, which is around 12 to 16 credits. Um, you'll be teaching, you know, an on, uh, you know, an in-depth semester long class in, you know, genetics, nutrigenomics, as opposed to, you know, the introduction. So the introduction gives you the flavor. If it's an approach people like, they can, you know, sort of after they dip their toes, they can jump in the deep end. And then we'll have, uh, not next year, but the probably a year from now, we'll be rolling out a, a degree in culinary medicine, a standalone degree. You know, and then an online equivalent, which would be, you know, so the equivalent college credits. Okay. So uh, I've gotten the green light, you know, from my dean. The people will getting their, be getting their degree from the University of Montana the College of Health. So an accredited, you know, institution. It's not, you know, Mike's Backyard, you know, journal uh, sort of thing. And you because a lot of these programs that you look at, you can pay a lot of money. And it, it's sort of not been vetted. You know, I've, and you know the science, you've worked so hard. And again, the book's a, a great point. You, you, you base that course on the book. All you have to do is look at the, the reference list, where you built it. It's evidence-based on the science. You know, I've, we've spent two years, you know, working with my dean to show him the evidence base so that we could create culinary medicine as a standalone as opposed to, you know, a class under the Aegeus of right. another yeah. department. And so um, I give my dean a, a, a lot of credit for doing that. And he's excited about it. So, and we oh, are too. Cool. Sorry, I just got this low battery warning here. So there we go. The universe <laughs> is telling us uh, time to wrap it up. <laughs> oh my God. No, that's awful. Oh, okay. Hey, Mike, uh, just tell people where they can find you and learn about the course. Oh, sure. Uh, www.chefdrmike, that's chefdrmike.com. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at the same, follow oh. us on Twitter at the same, and uh, Instagram for uh, at real chef dr Mike. Got it. And you know, I'm going to put this in the show notes in case you're getting this ding ding oh, from my computer. Great, Mike. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank Good you, Amanda. So guys. great. Bye bye. bye. Ah. <laughs>